Uh, take your seats. <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, this workshop is uh, titled Cooperation and Competition in the Global Jihad. My name is Asaf Mogadam. I'm the uh, Director of Academic Affairs uh, at the ICT. Uh, and I have the honor of uh, co-chairing this panel with uh, uh, Peter Bergen, who, uh, whom I'm going to introduce shortly. Uh, we have a really, truly uh, outstanding group of uh, panelists with us today who are coming from a, a broad variety of backgrounds. Uh, they include longtime analysts for the U.S. government uh, and international organizations, uh, think tank scholars, uh, journalists, and uh, academics. This year's workshop is devoted to the discussion of the nature and current state of the global jihad movement, which is, of course, very fitting uh, given the date. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's now 13 years exactly to the date since the United States was uh, attacked on its, uh, on its homeland. Uh, so 13 years after that horrific date, the global jihad movement, which was spawned by the Al-Qaeda organization, continues to evolve and threaten governments in broad parts of the Middle East and uh, uh, beyond, governments and populations, of course. The rise of the, uh, of the Islamic State which now dominates significant parts of uh, Syria and of Iraq, is a reminder that even if the Al-Qaeda uh, organization, Al-Qaeda Central, has weakened since the death of Osama bin Laden, the threat posed by the broader global jihadi movement is not likely to dissipate anytime soon. This year's uh, workshop is especially devoted to questions of competition and cooperation within the global jihad movement. Um, it will be no news to this audience that, this, uh, that the global jihad movement is, is not a unitary actor. It consists of different groups, Al-Qaeda, uh, its, its various affiliates, associated movements, um, as well as ideologically like-minded groups that are in competition with Al-Qaeda, such as the Islamic State. If we want to understand the global jihad movement, we must understand the relationships between the constituent elements of this movement. Understanding those relationships uh, is of key importance for policymakers because synergy between these groups, between these various nodes, harms Western interests, whereas discord between these actors actually serves Western goals. Now, there's no easy way to conceptualize these relationships between these various uh, nodes of the global jihad movement, but we may think of these relationships as uh, being situated on a spectrum that spans cooperative relationships on one hand and competitive relationships on the other hand. And there are, of course, important examples for both ends of the spectrum. The relationship between Al-Qaeda and its closest affiliates, such as uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, perhaps, is one of cooperation. Such cooperation can even amount, under certain circumstances, to a full-scale merger uh, between groups as happened, for example, uh, in the case of uh, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad under Ayman al-Zawahiri and the Al-Qaeda organization. But jihadi groups are also no strangers to infighting, and such competition can, of course, emerge even among former jihadi allies. The current rise of the Islamic State, formerly known as ISIS, formerly known as the ISI, formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, is a case in point. Ten years ago, the predecessor organization of the Islamic State, then led by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, formally swore allegiance to bin Laden and became Al-Qaeda's branch in Iraq. Today, after, several, after these uh, several uh, name changes, the Islamic State is Al-Qaeda's key competitor in the jihadi universe, with some analysts arguing that it has even eclipsed Al-Qaeda in both capacity and importance. That is, I think, a discussion that still left to be, a question that still has to be answered, or has to be seen. The cooperative and competitive relationships between the various constituent parts of the global jihad movement are difficult to understand in part because they are extremely dynamic. In addition, cooperation and competition between terrorist actors is, from an academic perspective, under-theorized. Today's panelists are as well suited as, as anyone, really, to help us enlighten the theoretical and policy discussion on the state of the global jihad, including the relationships between its constituent parts. Um, so uh, just before uh, I will introduce the, uh, 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 my uh, co-chair, uh, Peter Bergen, um, who, sure, doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to introduce him uh, anyway. Um, 
Uh, I would just like to, uh, to present very quickly um, uh, two, um, uh, two conceptual frameworks for, in which we can understand uh, competition and cooperation. And uh, please pardon me for my same shameless self-promotion, but uh, uh, Brian Fishman and, and myself, in a, uh, in a book that was published a couple of years ago, um, we looked at, uh, we tried to, uh, we tried to uh, show uh, the main uh, issues around which we can see uh, jihadi divisions, both within the Al-Qaeda movement as well as around the broader Al-Qaeda movement. Uh, and so Brian and I, Brian is actually a colleague of uh, Peter Bergen at the New America Foundation, uh, Brian and I identified uh, six or seven uh, main factors around which the jihadi movement is uh, split. They include questions of ideology, uh, questions uh, such as what are the actual goals of the movement, who is the enemy, right? There are very important divisions within the jihadi movement over um, are the uh, apostates, right, the internal enemy, the main, uh, the main enemy. Is it the West? Is it the crusader uh, countries led by the United States? Is it the Zionist enemy, right? These are very, very important uh, points of contention within the jihadi movement. There are, of course, a lot of fault lines around questions of strategy, right? Should we uh, target the near enemy first? Should the movement target the far enemy first? There are important questions over tactics, right? Um, the most horrific and barbaric tactics used, uh, exemplified by the Islamic State, are not the types of tactics that are exemplified, that, that are uh, uh, carried out broadly within the movement. Right? The, uh, the heinous beheadings uh, are not universally praised, with, even within the uh, broader Al-Qaeda movement. Important divisions about structure, but also uh, uh, more mundane questions, divisions over more mundane issues such as power. Who will lead the movement? Right? Who is uh, best suited to, uh, uh, to help redeem the Islamic uh, community of believers? So um, if this is uh, just one way, and of course not the only way to conceptualize of uh, jihadi uh, divisions, um, let me also just quickly uh, present uh, my own uh, uh, conception of how we may think of uh, cooperation before we'll turn it over to uh, the panel. Um, I believe that we can think of cooperation not only between, not only within the uh, jihad movement, but also really in the realm of, 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 of terrorist actors in general. Uh, I believe that we can identify two different uh, main types of uh, terrorist cooperation. One that I call high-end cooperation, the other one uh, I call low-end cooperation. Uh, two main uh, examples of high-end cooperation are mergers. Mergers are really the ultimate form of cooperation if you think about it. They're designed to last for a long time, right? You have a unification of command control. Um, you, have, uh, you have to have an ideological alignment. Right, and so there's a, uh, there has to be a very, very large degree of trust. Uh, so high-end cooperation and strategic alliances are also uh, part of high-end cooperation. I think that uh, a good example for strategic alliance is the alliance between Al-Qaeda uh, and its most close affiliates, such as the AQAP. Um, they are just short of mergers because they have not unified their command and control. However, right, the uh, expected time horizon uh, is long. There is certainly an ideological alignment there. Um, and uh, very, very close uh, cooperation along a variety of domains, including uh, logistical cooperation and even uh, operational cooperation, and certainly ideological cooperation. In terms of low-end cooperation, um, cooperation, of course, does not have to mean that people are ideologically aligned. Right? Um, I think an, an excellent example for what I call tactical uh, cooperation is the, uh, the off-and-on cooperation even between Al-Qaeda uh, and Hezbollah. Right. Uh, the 9-11 uh, Commission report um, spends a number of pages describing the uh, cooperation um, between Al-Qaeda and uh, Hezbollah in the run-up to 9-11. Uh, uh, to um, however, that cooperation is tactical. I don't believe that there's an expectation there that a cooperation between uh, a Shiite Hezbollah and this militant Sunni uh, Al-Qaeda is going to last long. Right? It is usually based on uh, on uh, identifying a common enemy or a common uh, opportunity to, uh, to interact over, uh, usually over some specific issues. Um, and then uh, perhaps the lowest form of cooperation is transactional cooperation, which is really a cooperation that takes place, uh, it involves perhaps you know, transfer of weapons, uh, it can be cooperation on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the basis of a, uh, certain exchanges or even barter agreements, right, and, and transac transna transactional cooperation certainly does also not have to involve uh, similar goals uh, or similar um, um, uh, expectations as to the, uh, the ideology. 
So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, close my introductory uh, remarks, and I would like uh, now like to introduce my um, my esteemed uh, uh, co-author. Uh, sorry, co uh, not yet co. <laughs> Perhaps at the next. Uh, my esteemed uh, co-chair uh, Peter Peter Bergen. Um, Peter Bergen is uh, uh, vice president uh, and director of uh, studies and uh, fellows of international of the international security program at at the New America Foundation. He's also a professor of practice uh, at Arizona State University. Um, and he is, of course, a very, very well-known uh, print, television, and web uh, journalist, uh, documentary producer, uh, think tank director, and the author of, uh, or editor of uh, five books, three of which were New York Times bestsellers, and three of which were also named uh, among the nonfiction books of the year by the Washington Post. Um, they have been translated, his books have been translated into about uh, 20 languages and have been uh, turned into three documentaries, one of which we're actually going to uh, screen later on today, uh, Manhunt, which tracks the, which traces the, uh, the hunt, the pursuit, the decade-long pursuit uh, after bin Laden. Um, Peter Bergen, among uh, many of his accomplishments, he was, uh, he of course, he's interviewed uh, bin Laden, I think, in 1997, uh, has produced also for CNN the interview. Uh, this was the interview in which bin Laden actually, for the first time, declared war in the United States for a Western audience. Uh, and in uh, 2011, when uh, after the U.S. raid uh, on bin Laden's compound in the Badabakh, Peter Bergen was actually the only journalist who has been granted access to the compound before uh, bin Laden's uh, safe house was actually demolished by the uh, Pakistani government. I could go on and on about uh, Peter. He has a very, very long and accomplished uh, bio, but um, uh, we will do that actually later on in the other event. Um, so um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to um, Peter. Thank you, Asaf. Um, so just um, I was some comments on what Asaf just said. Um, you know, one of the big takeaways from what we found at the compound was, of course, the um, the 17 uh, memos that were released, and uh, obviously it's a partial release. Uh, but in terms of the question of to what extent does Al Qaeda control even of its affiliates, I think the documents were pretty useful, and also groups that aren't necessarily affiliates, but are very closely aligned. And if there's a big takeaway from those documents, it is that um, Al Qaeda Central is as concerned about civilian casualties uh, this month, um, as any other uh, relatively um, responsible organization, or at least there was concern about Muslim civilian casualties. Um, and I think that is somewhat surprising and, of course, accounts for their divorce from, from ISIS. Um, but Al Qaeda, another big takeaway from those documents is Al Qaeda had absolutely no influence on its own affiliates about very key issues, whether it was, uh, and, but, but particularly on this issue. So, for instance, he said to that Al Shabaab shouldn't use the, you know, shouldn't rename itself Al Qaeda for because it would be bad for financing and it would be bad for, you know, it would attract a, a lot of uh, negative attention. But he also said that they should stop killing people in the central market in Mogadishu and they should focus on attacking African Union troops, which Shabab basically ignored. Similarly, uh, it wasn't clear if it was to bin Laden, but the senior members of Al-Qaeda wrote a letter to the Pakistani Taliban saying, you really need to kind of stop killing people in mosques and markets. And again, that was totally ignored. Uh, and that part of a, a long history of ignoring uh, advice from the central leadership of Al-Qaeda, whether um, that began in, uh, with Abu Musab al-Zakari ignoring the letter from Ayman al-Zawari back in 2005 about stopping uh, attacking Shia in their mosques. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, does, I mean, a question to ask is, does Al-Qaeda have any control at all over its local uh, affiliates? And that relates to another big question, which is, is Al-Qaeda just another Pakistani jihadi group at this point, which I think is what it is. It, it's, it's, its ability and pretensions to be some kind of global terrorist group, I think, are basically over. And if the full extent of its capabilities is being able to attack a 70-year-old American aid worker in Lahore with no security, Warren Weinstein, that isn't a particularly uh, uh, threatening group. Another uh, thing that I thought about as, as, as uh, Asaf was talking was, what other examples of divorces from Al-Qaeda Central can we think of? And I, the only other one, I think, is the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. Um, and that divorce, of course, was brokered by the Gaddafi regime, which is now looking a lot more, um, I guess, uh, ration, of a rational actor as Libya uh, collapses. And then I was also thinking about what other examples of cooperation exist um, that with groups that we don't necessarily think of uh, being part of uh, Al-Qaeda's immediate orbit. And I, I think one interesting one is Lashkar-e-Taiba, 
which Alexander knows a great deal about. Um, if you think about the fact that, and also Trisha, um, if you think about um, where Abu Zubaydah was captured in 2002, it was in a Lashkar Taiba safe house. If you think about where, when the embassy attacks happened, where the cruise missiles landed, they killed most, mostly Lashkar Taiba uh, members who were sharing training camps with Al Qaeda. Uh, so. Um, it's a very rich topic. We have a spectacular group of people to examine it in more detail. And I'll turn it back to Asaf. Thank you very much, Peter. Just, uh, just a few words about the, uh, the format. So what we're going to do in the first, uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, in the first part, we're going to uh, have the formal presentations by uh, the panelists, and then we'll have uh, uh, a break. We'll actually see how it goes, because we, uh, we had to uh, shorten the, uh, the panel by uh, 30 minutes. Uh, but we'll try to uh, break for about five minutes or ten minutes uh, and then reconvene for, uh, for discussion. Um, and hopefully we'll get uh, plenty of questions, of course, from the uh, audience. I know there are several very knowledgeable people uh, sitting here in the audience. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker, um, Trisha, uh, Dr. Trisha, uh, Dr. Trisha Bacon, uh, who is a professorial, professorial lecturer at American University's uh, School of Public Affairs. Uh, and before that, um, she uh, worked on counterterrorism for over 10 years uh, with the uh, U.S. government, specifically the uh, Department of uh, State, uh, including in the uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research uh, and the Bureau of Diplomatic uh, Security. She was also a pre-doctoral fellow at the Brookings Institution, a visiting scholar and Terrorism Research Award recipient at the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, START, at the University of Maryland. And uh, she uh, very recently completed her PhD at Georgetown University under Bruce Hoffman and uh, Daniel Byman. And she actually was uh, also the recipient of the Best Dissertation Award very re in the last issue of uh, the journal Perspectives on Terrorism. So uh, a very much a rising star. Um, welcome, Trisha. When your bio comes after Peter Bergens, you have to be, have a little bit of humility going into it. So I appreciate the very kind um, introduction. Uh, one of the themes of this week has been, has been ISIS and its rise in terms of its capability, its uh, social media capabilities in particular, how savvy it's been with social media, and its appeal that it has more broadly than a lot of organizations we've seen in the past, the influx of foreign fighters. And of course, it's brutality. These have, these have been a primary focus. And a theme underlying this, as Asaf raised, is the idea that with ISIS's rise, we've seen Al-Qaeda's decline. And it's certainly true that for the first time, arguably, Al-Qaeda has a genuine comp competitor, genuine rival for influence as a leader of the movement. But it's worth recalling, as we started to talk about, that about a decade ago, there was a very similar conversation going on with Al-Qaeda in Iraq. At this time, Zarqawi had pledged fidelity to bin Laden on paper, if not really in spirit. And even some members of al-Qaeda quipped that if they had realized that Zarqawi would be as influential as he was, they might have suggested that bin Laden swear allegiance to Zarqawi rather than the reverse. Um, so there was this sense even then that there was an organization that was poised to eclipse al-Qaeda. Interestingly, one key difference is that Zarqawi, while he didn't listen to al-Qaeda in any meaningful kind of way, still kept the, the Al-Qaeda brand alive for a while, during his lifetime because it benefited him. And the other thing that he did was he supported Al-Qaeda's position as the epicenter of relationships within the Sunni jihadist network. He supported Al-Qaeda as an alliance hub within the Sunni network. It was actually Zarqawi, if we recall, that brought the GSPC into the Al-Qaeda affiliation network. It was Zarqawi who proposed it to the GSPC that they consider affiliation with Al-Qaeda. And it was Zarqawi who assured al-Qaeda leaders, who were a little leery of Algerians, given their experience with the GIA in Algeria in the 1990s, that this was a valuable partner, and this was a partner that al-Qaeda should bring on board. So that's a key difference between ISIS and its, its predecessor, was the, their, their position vis-a-vis -vis al-Qaeda in terms of the relationships within the network. Instead, ISIS is launching a challenge to al-Qaeda's position as the leader in the movement. And as Al-Qaeda has done in the past, when it's in this position of weakness, it uses alliances to try and portray strength. And that's what we've seen in Zawahiri's recent announcement of the organization, what's the, what's the title? Al-Qaeda's organization in the Indian subcontinent. His recent announcement that this is a new Al-Qaeda branch or affiliate. And really, this announcement harkens back to previous announcements we've seen by Al-Qaeda. The announcement of the Egyptian Islamic group as an affiliate. 
and Libyan is, um, Islamic Fighting Group, as Peter mentioned, as an affiliate. Um, these are kind of faux affiliate announcements. They essentially reflect entities within the organization that were already incorporated. This is not an Al-Shabaab merger. This is not a GSPC merger. This is portraying an existing relationship as a new branch, a new affiliate, a new alliance, in order to portray strength, and that Al-Qaeda has continuing cachet within the movement. But it also reflects other dynamics that work in South Asia that are at risk of being overlooked as our focus has really turned towards ISIS in the Middle East. And that is, as Peter mentioned, Al-Qaeda has really become Pakistanized, if that's a word, and it is starting right now, um, in, in the intervening years. As Al-Qaeda has experienced losses, arrests, deaths, people fleeing the region for other conflict zones or just for their own security, it has been Pakistanis that Al-Qaeda has had to turn to to fill those voids in its ranks. And Pakistani militants are uniquely positioned to do so because there is a cadre of experienced militants within, within that, that, its own network. So it's really had to turn to Pakistanis over the years and there's been this gradual process of Pakistanization. Probably the most visible manifestation of this was Ilyas Kashmiri, the late Ilyas Kashmiri, who became something of a celebrity within the Pakistani militant network when he rose to be the most senior Pakistani within the organization. Um, it had this kind of attraction for, for those who had once been allied with the state, but now saw the Pakistani state as having essentially betrayed the movement. So you have this, this existing Pakistani core within Al-Qaeda, which, which Peter rightly points out is becoming more and more essentially a Pakistani organization. And in addition to that, Zawahiri's move to galvanize around the Indian cause is a reflection of Al-Qaeda's need to continue to attract Pakistanis. As it, as it continues to need to fill the ranks that, that it loses the, the people it does not recruit who are going to Syria instead, it has to rely on the Pakistani militant pool to fill that void if it's going to remain a viable organization. India, of course, is a long-standing cause, galvanizing cause for Pakistani militants. And this is, a, in some ways, a very savvy move to capitalize on that. Because for Al-Qaeda, India has always been a tertiary cause. Yeah, they're not crazy about the Hindus, but it's always been a fourth or fifth priority as far as Al-Qaeda is concerned. Whereas for Pakistani militants, this has long been the number one enemy. Um, even for some of the organizations which are not actually constantly engaged in the conflict in Kashmir. And this is also coming to a head as the U.S. prepares to withdraw and is beginning the drawdown in Afghanistan. This is going to ha leave a pool of hungry, excited, probably, um, claiming their own victory in Afghanistan. This is, there's going to be a pool of militants who are activated who want to be involved in the cause. And if history is any guide, India will bear the brunt of that transition from uh, out of Afghanistan and probably into India. Now, having said that, the conditions in India are vastly different now than they were in 1989, but that isn't to say that Pakistani militants and Al-Qaeda won't seek to capitalize on that and try and re-agitate tensions in India. This is also an indication of Al-Qaeda's desire to expand its appeal. While it has lost some appeal in the Arab world, it's looking to, to activate more Indian Muslims, which is not a, a population that Al-Qaeda has traditionally drawn much support from. It's also seeking to, to exploit causes like the Rohingyas in, in Burma and Bangladesh. So this announcement is also an, an attempt, rather than a reflection of an existing support base, it's an attempt to activate a new support base that Al-Qaeda has not traditionally reached very well with its kind of Arab-centric agenda. It's also worth pointing out that in this announcement, Zawahiri reaffirmed his pledge of allegiance to Mullah Omar. These two men have never been particularly close. That relationship was much more between bin Laden and Mullah Omar. So this, this reaffirmation of the allegiance to, to Mullah Omar is important symbolically. It also is another slight at ISIS. This is a pointing out, no, no, you are not the leader. You are not the caliph. We, we declare our allegiance once again to Mullah Omar. Underpinning that, though, is that Al-Qaeda has just declared its first branch in South Asia. So there's probably an element of reassurance that goes along with this as well. They very deliberately said Indian subcontinent, which does not include Afghanistan. So Zawahiri is probably making an effort to be clear to Mullah Omar that this new branch is not a challenge to the Afghan Taliban's leadership in the region. Um, it, there are currently no South Asian groups that have declared allegiance to Al-Qaeda, unless you count Fuji, Bangladesh in 1998 or something like that. When groups declare allegiance in South Asia, they declare it to Mullah Omar. He remains the, the figurehead that 
that garners those kinds of pledges of loyalty. So Zawahiri is, is very much reaffirming that um, in his recent announcement of his pledge to Mullah Omar. Overall, there are probably limited inroads for ISIS in South Asia. It's not an organization that was likely to garner a number of, of allies there. There's been a smattering of uh, pledges of allegiance to ISIS, kind of the new exciting kid on the block, some of which have subsequently been retracted, some of, it's, some of which came from kind of second tier organizations that aren't very well known. Um, but there are indications that ISIS is engaging in some propaganda, probably in part to unsettle Al Qaeda in the region. Um, but in doing so, ISIS also faces a need to challenge the Afghan Taliban's monopoly on the leadership position, which will be a tall order for the organization. But while Al-Qaeda may be weakened, this development of, of re-energizing its efforts towards India has pretty dangerous implications. Um, for the, those of us who've worked on South Asia for quite a while, we know that when there's an attack in India, there is one way that the finger points, and it usually points there fairly quickly, and that's at Islamabad. Um, and there's plenty of reasons and, and justifications for that. Therefore, inserting a new actor like Al-Qaeda into the mix, an actor that is not um, loyal to the Pakistani state, that is not likely to be restrained by the Pakistani state, like many of the proxy organizations, like Lashkar-e Taiba, runs the risk of the possibility that Al-Qaeda will launch an attack in India that the Indians will not be able to discern is not supported by the Pakistani state. And then we run the risk that we always do in these scenarios of tensions between the two nuclear powers at a maximum at a minimum, a derailing of any rapprochement that has occurred in recent years. So while Al-Qaeda in many ways may be down, it may be in the decline, um, it may be in eclipse, it still has quite a bit of potential to wreak havoc and wreak, wreak a lot of um, implications for the South Asia region, which also in turn has implications for the United States. So with that, I tried to be brief so everyone will get their time today, and I'll pass it back to Asa. Thank you very much, uh, Trisha. Um, Trisha is really uh, one of the leading experts um, uh, on terrorist cooperation also, and uh, specifically alliances. Uh, I think her dissertation was uh, 700 uh, pages long. 800, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, if you're actually looking to read a shortened version of it, then you should uh, get her uh, a book, which is going to be, uh, she's going to hopefully complete it by the end of the year. It's going to be, uh, it's forthcoming with uh, um, Pennsylvania University Press. Yes. Um, okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Alexander Evans. Um, uh, Dr. Evans is the uh, coordinator of a UN uh, Security Council expert team appointed in January 2013 by Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He was previously a senior fellow at, Jackson, uh, at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he taught uh, uh, courses on international relations. During 2012, he also led an Asia Society review of U.S. South Asia policy He's a former Henry uh, Kissinger Chair in Foreign Policy and uh, International Relations at the Library of Congress and has worked at the Department of State as a senior advisor, uh, first to Ambassador Richard, uh, to the late uh, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, and then to Ambassador uh, Mark Grossman, uh, the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan. And before working for the U.S. government, Alexander served as a British diplomat in Islamabad and New Delhi and is a member of the policy planning staff in uh, London. He has a PhD from uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies um, in uh, London, and uh, he was also appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire in the 2010 Queen's Birthday Honours List. The, the key thing to remember about OBE is when I worked in America, of course, in, in Britain, people take these things terribly seriously. Uh, and I, of course, for years said that if I was phoned up in, in, you know, with one of these offers, I'd say no. Uh, but my vanity, uh, my vanity defeated me within uh, seconds. Uh, but in America, in the, st in the U.S. government, it means overtaken by events, uh, which is the usual acronym. So, so in, in an apt way, the translation across the Atlantic is not always helpful. So, so look, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a, it's a real delight to be here. I thought um, Asif's uh, presentation was really interesting. And, and I'm certainly keen to go and read the book, which I haven't done. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to be with both Peter and Tricia. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of competition and cooperation, try and sort of pull back a little bit. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is I think, and I'll return to this at the end, I think one of the things that we are all very bad at, I think, in, in government uh, and as individuals, is we're all quite bad at thinking uh, strategically. And that means thinking in time, 
uh, to use the Ernest May phrase, uh, thinking historically uh, and thinking prospectively about the future in a way that doesn't then automatically default into uh, uh, predictive itis, you know, our, our desire to tell the world as it will be in six months or six years uh, or six decades. Um, and to do this, I want to sort of begin with uh, a chap called Tom Hughes. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of Tom Hughes, but hopefully some people have. Tom Hughes was uh, Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Research uh, in 1965, so where, where Tricia used to work, um, and then ended up as uh, President of the Carnegie Endowment uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and Tom uh, wrote a delicious piece about decision-making. Now, he was writing about decision-making in the intelligence community in the, the mid-1960s, but I think this applies much more generally. And in, in his piece, he, he, he said there are four types of men. This is the 60s, so apologies. He said there are four types of men that are present in any meeting. There are informed men with views. There are informed men without views. There are uninformed men with views. And there are uninformed men without views. Um, and he argued that every single meeting, particularly in government, is basically an exchange between these four types. Uh, and my experience in uh, an international organization and two national governments was certainly a test to that. Um, but the interesting thing is we're not always the same type in, uh, you know, all the time. You know, we may move from one meeting where we are informed and have a view to another meeting where we're uninformed but still have a view, that's perhaps me talking about myself, um, and so on and so forth. But what, what it means is um, people and interpersonal dynamics are incredibly important if we're trying to think about organizations and organizational behavior. And I would argue that that is important for, as is important for thinking about terrorism as it is for thinking about government, which is not to say um, that Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda affiliates operate in the same way uh, as an interagency meeting in Washington, D.C., but it is to say that some of the uh, psychological behaviors, uh, the group dynamics, the individual dynamics uh, that are exhibited in all of our lives are actually also going to be dynamics that are exhibited within terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda and affiliates. Um, so that's my sort of opener, as it were. People matter. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's the, the formation. How, how did people get to be where they are? The lies that we tell about who we are and how we became who we are, because we all tend to fictionalize a little bit the story of our lives and how we came to be, uh, hold the views we do. Uh, if you like, uh, our imaginary selfies. You know, what's, what's, the, what's the picture we'd like to present of ourselves uh, to others? Um, networks that we have, the informal social networks uh, that matter in organizational terms and often matter also in terms of influence, and that's as true in uh, militant groups as elsewhere. Um, and like Asaf, um, you know, I think there are divisions within the broader uh, Al-Qaeda and affiliate movement. I think there are divisions on targets. I think there are divisions on uh, the near slash far enemy, which to give more priority to. I think there are uh, divisions over power. Um, and there's also a balance, a rather delicate balance, between the local and the global. And those are dynamics that, that continue to matter. Uh, but in addition to the high-end and low-end cooperation that Asif set out, which I think is a really useful framework to think about how groups interact, I think we also need to think about um, uh, network-based cooperation. So in a sense, you know, some of the much more informal, fluid, social network-based interaction that takes place, but doesn't take place with a group identity. You know, it's, it's much more about who knows who, who's connected to who, who you influence by, who do you read, uh, who do you admire. Um, so I want to address four main themes uh, in, in my remarks. The first theme is, is, is ISIL the new Al-Qaeda? Um, and I think this is a wrong question. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit perturbed that this is a sort of, you know, in a sense, informing so much of a debate at the moment. Um, I think um, ideology matters enormously, and we should focus on the fact that this is broadly the same movement. Yeah? So we, in our team in, in New York, would argue that, that um, uh, ISIL is essentially a splinter of Al-Qaeda. It sits within the same ideological media. Of course, there are some of these differences, but these differences are actually uh, differences of finesse. They're not differences of fundamental substance. Um, and uh, there are some differences. Um, that having been said, there is clearly a struggle for 
uh, leadership for, for you know, status, if you like, the sort of the Malcolm Gladwell argument uh, applied to Al-Qaeda and affiliates. And Peter's absolutely right that Zawahiri is weak, um, but I, I think that Al-Qaeda is not done yet. Uh, and I think we should just think about, again, thinking in time, it's too early to, to call, I think, on that one. Um, what is clear is that Al-Qaeda has a human resources problem. It has a recruitment problem. It has a finance problem. It finds it difficult to raise and generate finances. And it certainly can't act as the, the funder and the commissioner that it has in the past. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, suffice it to say, it has a drone problem. Uh, and, and all of these, I think, inhibit the way in which it can uh, engage uh, with, uh, with its own organization as well as others. However, Al-Qaeda has something, and I think this is a, you know, my takeaway from the, uh, from the Zawahiri, the latest Zawahiri announcement, apart from the fact that it was a, a man in his 60s communicating for a very long time who clearly doesn't understand how young people communicate, um, is the fact that he talked about the importance of patience. Al-Qaeda is patient. And one of the key critiques that Al-Qaeda's leadership continues to offer of ISIL is that ISIL is impatient. ISIL, in essence, may overreach. And I don't think we should discount that patience, both in the Al-Qaeda core leadership, but also how that is refracted through some of the networks and organizations at Al-Qaeda, either give bayat or loyalty to Al-Qaeda, or have other connections. So that's a, you know, the first point is saying, I don't think this is the right question. And I do think we should see ISIL within the context of a broader Al-Qaeda movement. The second question is, are groups the most important ingredient? Uh, and I would say partly. Um, but as I said, I think we need to really think about uh, individuals and individual networks. Um, and you know, one of, the, one of the, I think, the, the macro themes that we've seen over the last decade and a half, and we're seeing it continuing now, is the growing prevalence of domestic radicalization. And my own country of origin, Britain, saw this uh, with a range of uh, you know, young second or third generation uh, British citizens who were radicalized, or often with some kind of connectivity to propaganda, yeah, or connectivity to networks, um, but often without a clear link to a particular group. So they were radicalized in the UK. But one of the things that happened was you'd see um, the ability to move, and, uh, and in the UK case, certainly when I was working in Pakistan, I led Britain's work on Pakistan's tribal areas for two years. Um, you would see these young British radicalized individuals travel to Pakistan, make connections, often connections actually in Pakistani administered Kashmir, and then use that Rolodex to get up to Pakistan's tribal areas, and then they became much more dangerous. So organizations or groups um, amplify the danger posed by radicalized individuals who have committed to violent extremism. Um, but this domestic radicalization that Britain saw pretty early has been replicated in parts of Europe, in North America. We're seeing it in Russia outside the North Caucasus. So, you know, this isn't just about uh, Chechens anymore. We're seeing it in China outside Xinjiang. And that is a new development in the last couple of years. We're seeing it in India, outside the traditional connectivity, which is you either connected with a group like the Students' Islamic Movement of India or with Lashkai Taiba. And instead, you're actually seeing domestic radicalization that is linked. Now, small numbers. But what I think you're looking at is a trend that is actually a macro trend taking place in, in multiple environments. Um, and you know, that, that means that individuals and individual networks remain important. My third argument is uh, a familiar one, uh, which is that ideas and methods are infectious. Uh, as the Oxford historian uh, Theodore Zeldin puts it, uh, ideas both good and bad are infectious, and I think he's right. Uh, and we can see that, uh, you know, not just in terms of the kitten meme uh, infecting uh, uh, ISIL Twitter feeds as much as my Facebook feed, um, but we can see it in terms of, uh, you know, negative ideas spreading quickly both in terms of propaganda messaging and style, but also in terms of types of attacks, types of targeting, types of messaging. Um, let me give a practical example. In 2005, um, you saw a spurt in uh, suicide bombing in 2005, 2006 in Afghanistan. And it, you know, it worked out that suicide bombing uh, was tremendously effective in attacking the Afghan 
uh, and coalition security forces. Uh, in 2006-07, you see that replicated in Pakistan. And, and these are you know, a range of networks where there are social networks and connectivity. So successful methods linked to some of these social networks transmit. Uh, and that, I think, is a real concern in terms of thinking about um, operate, you know, the, the way in which uh, groups actually operate and their methods. Um, the spread of multi-strike attacks, which you've seen spread across a range of different Al-Qaeda affiliates and associates. The use of the ISIL flag. And I think we need to put that in context. You know, every time that an ISIL flag pops up in a selfie somewhere, doesn't mean that there's an ISIL cell that's been established in that place. Um, the analog I would use is that um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in the 1990s focused on Kashmir, and, and my PhD is on Kashmir. Uh, and I spent a lot of time researching with Kashmiri groups. One of the things Kashmiris like to do is, uh, in cricket matches in, uh, in India is to hold up a green flag because it's a thing they know is really going to annoy uh, Indians. Yeah. So, so, so I, I wouldn't also underemphasize the degree to which, you know, how can you find the thing that is most offensive, most poisonous, and use that? And that may actually be as much a demonstration of sort of, um, you know, use wishing to be offensive as actual ideological sympathy for these groups. And we need to be able to distinguish very carefully between the two. And I think that both are true, but we need to be looking in a granular way at what's happening. What is clear is that ISIL is much better at propaganda than Al-Qaeda core, and that should not surprise us. Uh, Al-Qaeda core is roughly like uh, you know, me trying to explain to a group of my former undergraduates at Yale uh, what social media is about. Uh, my use of uh, Instagram is painful, uh, and you know, I see uh, you know, a, a range of people I know on Instagram, and I realize that I'm hopelessly uh, despite the fact I live in Brooklyn, which I think gives me hipster credibility, uh, you know, I lose, I, you know, I add, add, add 10 points for Brooklyn, deduct 8 for my inability to use social media. So I think the, the, you know, this, this has real implications. You, you have a Zawahiri who um, knows that the Rohingya issue, which Tricia mentioned, which I think is, has been really important in social media for a range of Muslim communities. He knows that the Rohingya issue is important. He says, ah, here is something that's animating young people. So I'm going to talk about it. So he's done now two messages, one, one of which was almost dedicated to the Rohingya issue. It had virtually no resonance. If you're looking at social media onward distribution of that message or response to that message, it, didn't, it, it, didn't, it, did, it wouldn't have hit a BuzzFeed top 10 list. So I think one of the interesting things is that ISIL is able to be more dexterous in communications and propaganda, and it is propaganda, partly because it just is younger. You know, the people associated with ISIL are younger. Uh, they come from the uh, audience groups that engage with social media. Um, and you've got this enormous diaspora of foreign terrorist fighters who've come into ISIL and who are able to engage in, in uh, communications. My fourth point is that the new, uh, the new Al Qaeda, uh, you know, structure, affiliates, associates, splinters is increasingly flat. And now, what do I mean by that? Um, I think you're seeing um, strategic goals set by uh, group leaders, and, and ISIL is a good case of this. But you're not necessarily seeing um, detailed micromanagement of, uh, of the entire organization. Even if there's a desire to micromanage, given the generation you're working with, that's simply not feasible. Yeah? Because everybody expects to be, if not chief operating officer of ISIL, then at the very least, chief spokesperson uh, with, their, with, the prefer, you know, with the most followers on Twitter within six months. So the systemized impatience of ISIL, we also need to see with the zeitgeist of the systemized impatience of a younger generation, or indeed younger generations, placing it in context. Um, and, you know, propaganda is an, is an example of this. The second thing is, is that the other form of flatness is around eating habits. Uh, now, this is me being a little bit facetious, but I'm also being serious. When Mark Sageman, a few years ago, tried to look into what, you know, what are, how do we understand radicalization, he took all the kind of categories that you could think of. Okay, is it religiosity? Well, no, because you know, the data set he looked at wasn't conclusive enough. Is it uh, alienation? Well, no, some of the people seem to be pretty well integrated. Is it, uh, you know, is it a prehistory of violence? So he looked at all the different factors that one could look at, and there was no real macro explanation there wasn't a predictive tool that we could use to kind of you know, screen you and say, are you going to be an Al-Qaeda terrorist? 
But one thing that did emerge from this is it seemed that most of the attack planning groups that had emerged were people who had eaten together. Because the way in which you build social capital and the way in which you build social networks often derives from spending large amounts of time with people. And how do we do that? You know, how would we mark most of our family, close family relationships or close friend networks? We spend a lot of time breaking bread with them. Um, and one of the things that was true in the 90s is that you had less, perhaps, interactivity between different food groups than you have now. And I'm not putting too much weight in this argument. So my, my macro version of this is those who eat together bond together because you actually have the bonding and the bonding gives you the social capital that then makes it plausible that you can actually generate kind of the trust networks that are required for some of this planning. But I think the broader point I'm making about flatness is not so much about food preferences. It's about um, interactivity and informal social networks. In the 1990s, um, is this on record or off record, he says? It's on record. In that case, I'm not going to say what I was about to say. <laughs> um, in the 1990s, I may have been in a town somewhere, in a country somewhere, <laughs> Uh, in which a range of groups, some of which morphed into uh, uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates, were present. And there was connectivity, but there was also separation. So if, you know, the group I was doing a lot of work on uh, was basically in one house in this town, and they would not talk to another group that was in another house in this town. Um, in the, but you still had a milieu in which people were not immune to understanding what was going on in that house or what they were reading or what they were doing. You know, people would have some sense, some semblance of what was happening in a broader community. In the 2010s, what we see now is foreign terrorist fighters, primarily in Syria, this extraordinary milieu. I have uh, one little video clip, um, which I think is telling. Uh, I like to show it to UN audiences, which is um, but one group actually has a translator working with it because they have Russians, French, or, or Russian, French, and English speakers operating in the same group. Uh, so, you know, the problems of multilateralism are not limited to the United Nations. Um, but I think that shows you, in a sense, the, the heterodox and potentially quite cosmopolitan nature of some of the groupings that are turning up in, in, in Syria. In Libya, you have this enormous melting pot. I know that Syria sucks up the oxygen in the room at the moment, and Iraq, but actually we shouldn't neglect what's been going on in Libya, where you have this, uh, you know, this enormous availability of arms and weapons. You have two governments, neither of which have very much sway. You have large amounts of not ungoverned space, but alternatively governed space. Uh, and, a, and an environment in which it's very easy, again, for a wide number of people to engage. And Afghanistan, and I'm really glad that Tricia raised Afghanistan. I think it's one to watch, um, because we're already seeing, again, some of these networks, some of these informal networks between parts of the Afghan Taliban you know, reaching out. There are small uh, groupings within the Afghan Taliban who've been making very favorable remarks about Al-Qaeda in, in recent months. Uh, the Haqqani network, elements within the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, small numbers of Lashkai Taiba personnel, Jamaat Ansarullah, the Tajik group, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. So if you look at Kunar Nuristan in Afghanistan, you're talking about environments again that are you know, very much a, a, a milieu for engagement between different groups and different people. And I do think it's going to be a problem for India, but actually I would focus uh, more immediately. I think the primary implications are going to be for Pakistan uh, and potentially for parts of Central Asia. And I would look at um, states like Tajikistan as a concern and maybe the Fergana Valley uh, as well in Central Asia. Um, and... Europe, question mark. You know, there are some people who would argue that um, various urban hubs in Europe are also providing this sort of social milieu in which different people can connect in different ways. So, so I would just sort of argue that a bit less focus, you know, groups are important, you know, statements are important, structures are important, those are definitely there, but I think we should also spend more time paying attention to granularity, informal networks, and the way in which um, a, a organizational silo-based uh, analysis of the, the Al-Qaeda movement may lead us to make analytical missteps in understanding the nature of the evolving threat. Um, so finally, uh, Ernest May. I, I, don't know, I, mean, I, I think the Ernest May Fellow from Harvard is present at this conference. And Ernest May uh, was a professor at Harvard who wrote, uh, um, or you know, jointly wrote a book uh, called Thinking in Time. 
Uh, and I've been very much influenced by this. Uh, I think uh, there's a problem of short-termism in government and in analysis, and there's a problem of a lack of historicity in government and analysis. Uh, and um, we all suffer from what I call recentism. Yeah? We reach back for the, uh, for the nearest analogy, the nearest conflict, um, and short-termism. So ISIL may not be it. <laughs> For all that's ISIL is important, and it clearly is important, and clearly needs addressing, and that's a lot of the work that our team are doing, um, we shouldn't fixate on ISIL to the exclusion of understanding ISIL in the context of its broader Al-Qaeda affiliate, associate, and splinter movement. Which means the movement, the network, affiliations, and ideas matter a great deal. And it also means that we need to focus on, in a sense, this kind of, the, the, not so much a word cloud, but a people cloud. Who are the people cloud who are associated with this? Uh, what are they thinking? What are they influenced by? Because the people cloud of 2014 is very different to the people cloud of 2005. And it's very different to the people cloud of 1995. So we should expect change, but I still would argue for um, looking at this within the, the broad scope of, of Al-Qaeda and affiliates. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Evans. Really a fascinating uh, look, and I, I really uh, I completely agree with you that uh, there is too much uh, attention, uh, emphasis placed on organizations to the detriment of looking at uh, informal actors and, and, and people. Who are really, uh, um, and I think one of the uh, problems really is that social science, academia, if you if you will, um, is really only catching up with the tools to actually uh, to measure and to and to track those uh, developments. Uh, because social science is much much more familiar with organizations; it knows how to, how to research them. Uh, but that's something that really we have to, uh, as a, speaking as a social scientist, we better get our act together. Um, okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Uh, David Gartenstein uh, Ross, um, uh, senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of uh, Democracies and an adjunct professor in uh, Georgetown University's Security Studies program, um, who has been focusing his research on the challenges posed by violent non-state actors, and he's been the author uh, uh, or volume editor of uh, 12 books or monographs, uh, most recently uh, Bin Laden's uh, Legacy, a book that was published in 2011 by Wiley. Uh, really very widely pu published, uh, one of the most thoughtful commentators on, uh, especially on the Global Jihad movement, which I, uh, I follow um, regularly, almost religiously. Um, and uh, really published in uh, uh, many places. He has, uh, he just also, uh, like Tricia, recently completed his uh, PhD at the uh, Catholic University of America, uh, where he also received his uh, uh, MA. He also has a JD uh, cum laude from the New York University School of Law and a BA from uh, uh, Wake Forest University. Also a senior fellow at George Washington University's Homeland Security Policy Institute and a visiting research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism at uh, The Hague. Welcome, uh, David, welcome back. Thirteen years ago today, um, I was uh, actually in New York City. Um, I lived in the West Village and was able to uh, watch the towers smoldering from right outside my apartment. Um, three years ago today, uh, I was doing something much less momentous to history, uh, which is uh, waiting for um, or launching uh, a new book, uh, which Asaf had mentioned, Bin Laden's Legacy. Um, the thesis of the book was that we haven't really understood uh, the Al-Qaeda network well. And as such, uh, strategically, uh, we weren't doing all that well. Uh, at the time, it was thought to be fairly quaint, uh, in part because uh, you just had two major developments uh, change the competition between the US and Al-Qaeda. Uh, there was, on the one hand, bin Laden's death. And on the other, uh, you had the Arab Spring, which had uh, transformed the region. Um, it was thought that this was going to be uh, a declining problem uh, as opposed to a growing one. Now, flash forward uh, three years uh, to today, and the world looks a lot better from al-Qaeda's perspective and from the perspective of jihadist groups. Uh, Iraq and Syria um, are obviously a complete mess, uh, with Syria basically destroyed at this point as a nation state. Um, ISIS being in control of a large swath of Iraq and about 30% of Syria. Uh, Libya is um, a festering sore. 
uh, with uh, spreading instability throughout the region and a place where uh, Islamist groups uh, are currently doing battle with Khalifa Hifter and his militia. Um, you look to Tunisia and you have a burgeoning jihadist movement that didn't exist before, Egypt uh, and a situation in the Sinai that has certainly grown worse since the military coup. Uh, overall, jihadism is back. Like, it has to be understood in the context of an environment of growth. Uh, there are three major points I want to make in this uh, presentation, which I'll keep, uh, I hope, somewhat short. Uh, one of them is understanding environmental factors, background factors, because that fundamentally influences what competition and cooperation means. Competition is much more harmful to jihadist groups when you're in an environment where jihadism is on the decline. When it's, when it's growing, uh, you may be able to sustain uh, more than one major jihadist group that's globally focused uh, quite comfortably. Second thing I want to emphasize is the upside of conflict, uh, to Al-Qaeda in particular. Um, I uh, agree with Asaf um, that uh, competition in general is harmful to the jihadist movement. But there's one thing that's going on now which I will get to which I think is very dangerous, um, and there are ways that Al-Qaeda is using this conflict to its favor. And then the third thing I want to emphasize is uh, limitations of our knowledge. Um, so uh, let me say, I, th I think this is an excellent panel. I mean, I think that the, the first two presentations did a, a great job of bringing a fresh perspective and cutting against um, a, a lot of what I see as being fairly stale conventional wisdom. So uh, and uh, thank you, Asaf, for um, bringing me in to be a part of this, and thank you, Peter, for uh, chairing the panel, someone who I've respected within the field since the day that I entered it. Um, when we look at Al-Qaeda versus the Islamic State, um, you know, there's a few ways that this competition has been framed. Let me offer one other way. I mean, I think that, that um, Dr. Evans' uh, um, observation that it's you know, young versus old is, is absolutely correct. Um, but there's another uh, contrast between the two which is an open network versus a closed network. Um, an, for an open network is one that is set to expand. Um, and it's something that's very much enabled with the rise of social media and different ways of communicating. If you think of, for example, um, you know, uh, three years ago this was important. Today people have kind of forgotten about it. But if you think of Occupy Wall Street, that's a, a preeminent example of an open network in that you know, it's designed for people to just pick up the banner and you know, I'm part of Occupy, and there's not necessarily a central guiding leadership. Instead, um, it was what people said it is. Um, Al-Qaeda has always been, uh, in contrast, largely a closed network. Not entirely, but largely a closed network. And the reason is for its own survivability. That when you're a uh, militant organization, um, it makes sense to keep your activities as clandestine as possible. Otherwise, you can be targeted. In contrast, ISIS is very much an open network. Um, you know, I remember hearing uh, not too long ago um, an analyst in the field talking about how you know, ISIS lacks operational security. This is being framed as an advantage, that you know, they're on the battlefield. They're tweeting about it. It's giving real-time updates. It's energizing a base. That's what they're designed to do. Now, they're not a completely open network. There's a lot of secrecy involving Baghdadi. They certainly do have operatives who have better operational security than others. But there's not a whole lot of message control. And so as a result, the kind of Lord of the Flies type uh, rule that they've brought to Syria and Iraq makes its way onto social media all the time. Right now we look at this as an advantage. And there's a lot of advantages to it. But there's also a, a very big downside for them as well of being an open network. They don't control their message effectively. And you can see uh, with new directives being handed down on the battlefield that they're trying to. Uh, they're trying to caption the number of severed heads that are displayed on social media and to caption the people actually filming and distributing beheadings. Um, in part because what they're doing right now, communications wise, is a great strategy while they're winning. When they start losing, there's a downside. So when you look at this competition, um, you know, I, I would go one step further than Dr. Evans. I, I, I think that rather than, I mean, he said, and I agree, that we shouldn't assume that, that ISIS is it, 
that it's the big new thing. I would go a step further and say that it's not full stop. Um, that's not to say it won't be important for some time to come, but uh, I would project that the most likely scenario, not the inevitable scenario, but the most likely scenario is that it passed its peak uh, in early August um, and that it's going to hit, a, it's in a period of decline right now. Um, now, ultimately, the international coalition is going to influence that. I do think that ISIS should be the top U.S. priority at the moment. Um, but I think in terms of longer-term competition, I'm more concerned about al-Qaeda. And look, I agree with Dr. Evans that to some extent the competition between the two of them is, uh, you know, they're two sides of the same coin. Uh, but the differences are important. Um, and again, I'll, there's kind of a payoff, which I'll get to in a moment. But looking at, 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 ISIS's, the, at what ISIS is doing, the very first thing to note is that they're terrible strategists. Uh, I mean, you should not fight a war on two fronts, especially when you're a non-state actor whose core force is less than 30,000. They're fighting a war on about six, eight different fronts all at the same time. It's not a war that they're going, where, where they were going to be able to sustain gains, full stop. Uh, if you look at, they, they've opened up new fronts constantly. The Kurds were not fighting them, and they opened up a new front against the Kurds. What do they do then? There's a minority religious group, the Yazidis, who pose no military threat to them, and then they decide to commit genocide against the Yazidis. This is an insane decision. Like, it's an insane decision. They're fighting all these other forces. They're fighting probably seven different actors at once, and they decide to deploy massive military forces to destroy the Yazidis, which then brings in the United States and all the other Western countries, which are about to uh, enter uh, into Iraq through an aerial campaign, not through a conventional forces campaign. This is not good strategy. Um, the second thing, as I said, is I believe that they're going to soon experience battlefield losses, that that is the most likely outcome. Uh, if so, then the brutality that they've been showing is now going to look bad. Uh, Dr. Bacon referred to um, uh, uh, Zarqawi uh, and how back in 2005, 2006, People were asking whether Zarqawi was the new leader of global jihad. Well, he looked a lot like ISIS does now. He had fewer resources, less money, didn't control as much territory, um, but he was doing fairly well on all those fronts. And he was so brutal that it ended up not only destroying AQI, his organization, but by 2010, a lot of analysts thought it had destroyed Al Qaeda as a brand. That's how toxic it ended up being. In 05 to 06, it was thought of as good propaganda. You know, he was beheading people, and in the Middle East, you can see people taking on his headgear, which was referred to in some markets as the Zarqawi. I mean, he was thought of as being the charismatic guy. Four years later, not only was he dead, but his brand was thought of as being so toxic that it couldn't attract young people anymore. A third weakness that ISIS has is they have a business model which depends on a steady stream of recruits. Um, or for Al Qaeda, if they miss recruits, it's not clear that it would devastate the organization at all. Um, they have recruits in reserve. Um, they're a model which is very much based around the affiliates. Uh, with they, they look like a pyramid, uh, and you know at the top you have the central leadership, which has less money than the affiliates, uh, and it also has uh, less manpower than the affiliates. This isn't um, bec this isn't just a factor of the pressure applied to the central leadership though there certainly is pressure, it's also by design. Whereas for ISIS, which is fighting constantly, uh, it's a model that basically depends upon getting people to come in and join the organization. Now they're trying to make up for that with conscription, and they've conscripted a lot of people, uh, but ultimately it's gonna be difficult for them to sustain the momentum that they have right now. Uh, and then a fourth and final problem is their caliphate announcement, that a lot of their legitimacy rests upon the idea that they have reestablished the caliphate. And um, one thing this means is they have to maintain it. Uh, that means that, that on the battlefield, they'll probably expend more military resources than they should trying to sustain territory which is key to a caliphate, as opposed to what Al-Qaeda affiliated organizations have done everywhere, from Somalia to Mali to Yemen, which is melting back in the face of offensives, then regrouping. It's di more difficult for ISIS to do that because their messaging and their competition with Al-Qaeda is based on the idea that the caliphate is here. So, looking at it from the Al-Qaeda side, 
I think right now we are underestimating Al Qaeda at the same time that we're overestimating ISIS. Um, Al Qaeda has a fairly robust international network, and uh, Dr. Bacon talked at some length about the U.S. drawdown from Afghanistan. As the U.S. draws down, um, they're going to be in a better position uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan um, than they are now. Uh, just like uh, ISIS was in a much better position after we left Iraq. Um, that's simply a fact of a vacuum being created. Uh, the Taliban, which has never broken with Al Qaeda, uh, will be a much more powerful player. That's something that every intelligence agency predicts. Um, but here's the real problem. I alluded to this before. Um, but this is the way in which competition actually helps Al Qaeda. And as I said, it hurts them in many ways, but there's one way it helps them, which is uh, Peter Bergen alluded before to the Abbottabad documents, the documents that were captured from bin Laden's compound. Uh, one thing that they show, in addition to concern about civilian casualties, is the fact that prior to his death, bin Laden wanted to rebrand Al Qaeda and because of all the damage that Zarqawi, the leader of the group that would become ISIS later, had done to the brand. You could not have a better opportunity to do so than ISIS. You know, ISIS represents every excess that it po you possibly could get within the jihadist world, from beheadings to genocide to sexual slavery. Al Qaeda is able to contrast itself with that as a more rational, almost moderate version of jihadism. And in the West, people largely think of that as crazy. Once in a while I run into people even in the intelligence apparatus um, who will ask me, and this is a literal quote, well, if there's good Taliban and bad Taliban, maybe there are good jihadists and bad jihadists. Maybe Nusra, Al-Qaeda's Syria affiliate, is good jihadists. Um, I quickly disabused that person of, of uh, what I see as a grave misconception. But in the region, in the region, that's a pretty powerful view. If you look at it from the perspective of the Turkish government or the Qatari government, <clears throat> or even to some extent, and let, let me explain this in a second, the government of Jordan, there's this notion that maybe Nusra slash AQ can be good jihadists. Now, I said I wanted to explain it in, in the context of Jordan because Jordan is a very moderate state. Um, but you know, when they're looking at the problem of the growth of ISIS, <coughs> I think one thing they're looking to is whether Al Qaeda could be a hedge against that. It's a bad idea. Uh, it's the equivalent of the old lady who swallowed the fly but it's an idea that's being bandied about. And if you're Al Qaeda, you play that up. It's actually a very good opportunity for them. I think right now, uh, Al Qaeda is not going to try to carry out a major terrorist attack. They want to let the United States and others <coughs> really, uh, sorry, I really should have brought uh, water up here. Um, and thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. Great. Sorry. International flights. Um, so, let me actually just close with a couple of very quick thoughts. <clears throat> One thing is that what I explain in terms of ISIS's weakness, it's not inevitable. <clears throat> a, th a few things could actually change and make them more powerful. One of them is a major ISIS attack against a Western target. That's something that could push so much momentum towards them that it would strengthen them. The second thing is development of an international network. Right now, they don't have a strong international network. If they're able to develop one, uh, then <clears throat> that changes the dynamic. And the third thing is that if they're able to sustain battlefield gains in the face of all these enemies, that's something which could actually help this organization. So look, the two takeaways, I, I'd say, are we have to understand uh, our enemies as strategic actors. Obviously, I don't have much respect for ISIS as a strategic actor. Um, I think Al-Qaeda is the more strategic of the two. But the more we see them as unable to execute strategy, the less we'll be able to anticipate what's to come. And the second thing, uh, as I emphasized before, is our limitations of our knowledge. Right now, uh, and I think um, Dr. Evans did a good job of outlining this, we tend to project out that you know, Al-Qaeda's weakness, ISIS's strength are going to sustain. I would call that into question, and that's one reason why I really see Al-Qaeda as being the, the bigger long-term problem, especially given what they actually gain 
from this competition. Thank you and apologies for my throat. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I think at a time when there's really a lot of uh, alarmism, maybe even a hysteria about the rise of, uh, of ISIS, you bring in a lot of uh, nuance uh, to the table, as always. Um, okay, our last uh, speaker, uh, and then we'll have a break and we'll then reconvene um, for discussion, is uh, uh, Aaron Zellin, who is the Richard Borough Fellow at uh, uh, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy my old employer, um, where his uh, research focuses on how jihadist groups are adjusting to the new political environment in the era of Arab uprisings and Salafi politics in countries transitioning to democracy. He is also a PhD candidate at uh, King's College of London and a fellow at its Associated International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. Previously, he was a research associate at uh, Brandeis University where he, uh, uh, where he uh, worked for Dr. Jutta Clausen. Uh, analyzing a wide range of primary source material. Um, he is also, um, uh, Zellin is uh, um, a frequent contributor to uh, foreign policy, uh, foreign affairs, The Atlantic, many other outlets, and he independently maintains uh, the widely cited and I may say indispensable uh, website jihadology.net and also co-edits the blog Al Wasat. So, great pleasure to have you back here. Thanks for having me. Um, I think that this has been a really great panel so far. Um, and some of the things that, themes and issues that people have been talking about, I think uh, I'm going to try and bring together and what I've been talking about since, um, as Alexander noted, there's been a lack of history when talking about these issues, especially related to the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and the competition and what's been going on. Um, and a lot of it, even though when you read the media, it seems like it's the newest thing ever, what we see really has, um, you know, a lot of uh, history to it that goes back about 13, 14, 15 years ago. So I just thought it would be good to step back a little bit and talk a little bit about that, the frame of the um, relationship between Al-Qaeda and the group that currently calls itself the Islamic State, though obviously has had a number of names over the years. Um, so for background, the group itself, as I noted, has gone through a number of names. First, it was Jamaat al-Tawheed wal-Jihad, and this was founded by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi in around 1999-2000. And that was after he was, uh, he was released from prison, after the king came to power. Um, and he went over to Afghanistan to set up shop and do some training to then hopefully do local jihad back home against the monarchy. Um, and then potentially larger into the Levant, as well as the fact that um, he had issues with the Shia, which we see profoundly now with the Islamic State as well. Um, but the thing to remember is that when he went to Afghanistan, Bin Laden was sort of the king of the castle there, and a lot of things had to go through him um, uh, in terms of other groups trying to get set up. Um, part, of the issue, part of the reasons why there have been issues going back that far is because of the backgrounds of these two individuals. One, Bin Laden has a high level of education, uh, he's more elite, um, and his main focus was on the far enemy, whereas Zarqawi, less educated, uh, thug in some ways, a criminal, um, and his focus was more on the local enemy. So there's always this issues between them going back then. Um, and while eventually Saif al-Adil sort of intervened and allowed um, them to operate in Afghanistan, um, they never really saw eye to eye. Fast forward to the start of the Iraq war and after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, Zarqawi went over to Iraq, set up a bunch of contacts, and started doing the attacks against U.S. forces as well as a number of other individuals as we know about. Um, as a result, he gained a lot of notoriety through the media, um, but the problem was he had an issue of resources and recruits because he didn't have the same type of global network that Al-Qaeda did, but because Al-Qaeda's network started shifting to Pakistan and going more into hiding, they wanted to remain relevant, and therefore we had this um, marriage of convenience between the two groups, which led to Al-Qaeda in the land of two rivers, or Al-Qaeda in Iraq, as most people know it by. Um, while this happened, there were still issues between the groups, and even though um, the merger happened in 2004, you saw already a year later in 2005 that Ayman al-Zawahiri, then the deputy leader, and then Atiyatollah Abdul Rahman al-Libi, who is a key ideological figure in the group, um, who's now dead, uh, sent letters to Zarqawi telling him they need to stop being so excessive and brutal in what he was doing. So even though they had this marriage of convenience, 
Um, there are always these tensions there. Um, then, you know, things shifted related to what was going on in the ground in Iraq. Um, there's a debate in the U.S. about, you know, potentially withdrawing troops in 2006. Um, and, and one of the things that um, Zawahiri and Zarqawi tried to talk about was how to prepare for that. And as a result, they created the Majlis Shur al-Mujahideen, as well as a way to sort of rebrand themselves as a result of the excesses. Of course, as we know, the U.S. did not withdraw in 2006, 2007, but instead there was the surge, which helped um, sort of solidify a lot of what was already going on the previous year or so related to the Sahwa movement. Um, and then only about eight months later, they then changed their name again to the Islamic State of Iraq, which sort of formalized their control over a bunch of territory. Um, but as David noted, um, uh, related to now, um, similar thing happened back then is that when it seemed like they're at the height of their power in terms of gaining territory, um, it was really the beginning of the decline due to um, the ways that they governed. Um, and then they never really went away necessarily, but they were pushed back. Um, and one of the problems is that, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, because the ball was sort of t taken off of Iraq after the U.S. left, people sort of forgot about it. But the fact is, is that there were still more deaths per month in Iraq than even in Afghanistan after the U.S. left Iraq. Um, and therefore, um, you know, it was something that people missed in many respects, even though it didn't necessarily go away. Things sort of got patched up behind the scenes between the two groups, Al-Qaeda Central and the Islamic State of Iraq but there are still general problems related to them. Um, but this really came more into being as the Syrian conflict got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and as we know, um, in April 2013, uh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani announced that, um, and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of the group, announced that, uh, you know, that they're extending themselves into Syria and changing the name of the group again to the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham. Of course, um, this changed the game because the group there that was originally created by um, uh, ISIS, Jabal al-Nusra, which is led by Abu Muhammad al-Jalani, um, they actually rebuffed this move. And unlike sort of the narrative that was originally created that there was a merger of these two, two groups, it was actually the first signs that there really was a break in the foundations between them um, and Jabal al-Nusra slash al-Qaeda. And then, as we know, they've changed their name again more recently to just the Islamic State or the Caliphate. Um, uh, to get drilled down more into what's been going on in Syria to better understand what we've seen and how this has evolved, um, even though most people started paying attention to the jihadi entrance only in the fall or winter of 2012, um, they really had a plan going back to when the conflict really started. Of course, the protests in Syria started in March 2011, but the Free Syrian Army was organized in about June, July 2011. Um, but the first cases of jihadis entering the conflict was in July 2011, when there were uh, discussions behind the scenes between Ayman al-Zawahri, who then was the leader of the group, um, as well as Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of uh, ISI at the time, um, about you know, sending in individuals. This, of course, became what is known as Jabhat al-Nusra today. Um, and over time, they set up a bunch of different cells in different locales within Syria um, to sort of organize and boost themselves before they made their official announcement in January 2012. Um, we also started to see the signs of foreign fighters going in in August 2011. Um, so it's really been a theme going back to the beginning of this conflict. Um, and I'd argue that uh, the official announcement of Jabhat al-Nusra really is the first wave of foreign fighters going in. Because um, I, I would argue that there have been three spikes, essentially. That was one of the first ones. Um, and one of the interesting things that Jabal al-Nusra did, um, uh, and, and I think many uh, other analysts of, the, of, of jihadism noticed, was that it appeared that they really had you know, taken to heart some of the lessons of the Iraq War last decade in terms of all the excesses and poor ways of going about reaching out to the local communities. Um, you know, Jabal al-Nusra was willing to work with other uh, rebel actors. They weren't trying to alienate them. And then when some of the rebel groups started taking over territory in Syria, they helped um, govern with them. They weren't trying to dominate or monopolize that. And we still see that now with Jabal al-Nusra um, to this day in a number of locales that are still under rebel control in northern and even parts of southern uh, Syria now. Um, and as a result, when the U.S. decided to designate them in uh, December 2012, um, uh, most of the rebel groups actually put out statements and had protests against this from the United States showing that, in fact, they really did accomplish something in this more of soft power way about doing things or this more gradual, longer-term process. Um, 
Of course, because of the, this bearing fruit, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISI, believed that the time was then ripe for um, showing that they were the ones who were really behind Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, and, and that's why they made the announcement in April 2013. But as I noted, Jalani rebuffed them, and then officially, for the first time publicly, um, pledged Bayat Ayman al-Zawahiri and al-Qaeda, though it's believed that he uh, had pledged previously. Um, as a result, this sort of started this competition, though on the ground we didn't really see overt fighting between the two groups. There was a lot of discussions behind the scenes to try and reconcile issues. Um, but from the perspective of ISIS, when they changed their name, that was sort of like the major cut for them, whereas it was more al-Qaeda trying to fix any of the issues. Then, only a month later, you started to see the overt entrance of Shia militias, Lebanese Hezbollah, Qatab Hezbollah, Saab al hal Haq, Badr organization, as well as a number of individuals. This led to the second spike in foreign fighters. Um, and one of the things that really sort of drove home the sort of end of the overt relationship, or I guess covert relationship too, between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State was uh, the uprising by the rebels in January and February this year. Um, you had a number of mainstream rebel groups as well as some more radical Salafi groups um, start to push back against their entrance into Syria and some of the territory they gained, and they were able to push them out of Idlib and Aleppo governorates. Of course, uh, the Islamic State has since retaken some of the rural areas in Aleppo governorate, but they have not been able to return to Aleppo city. Um, um, but because of this, and along with the failure of a reconciliation attempt by a key sheikh, uh, Muhaysini, a Saudi cleric who's in Syria now, um, as well as a failed reconciliation behind the scenes between Al-Qaeda slash Shabbat al-Nusra and the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda decided to publicly, officially disaffiliate itself with one of its branches for the first time in its history. Um, and as a result, since then, there's been open warfare between the two groups. Um, so this sort of helps explain what the evolution of what we have seen and where things have been going. Um, and just to, you know, I've, I've discussed a little bit about the thir first three things, but I wanted to get into sort of some of the key issues related to these splits. Some of them have already been mentioned in prior um, uh, discussions in this panel. Um, one of them, I believe, is generational. I would argue that many of those who sort of came of age and went to fight in Afghanistan in the 1980s and 1990s are more close to Al-Qaeda and its branches, whereas those who have come of age during the Iraq War last decade as well as the Syrian War um, in the last couple of years are more prone to support um, uh, the Islamic State. And part of this is just related to the fact that when you go to Afghanistan, you're going through the networks of Al-Qaeda and its now affiliate branches too, um, whereas when you've been going to Iraq and Syria, it's been more through these ISIS networks. Um, of course, this isn't like a hard line in terms of there's no young people with Al-Qaeda or there's no older individuals with the Islamic State. But when you look at the broader trend, you sort of see this there. Um, and then one of the things that they would argue is that they have a different of manhaj or methodology. This is supposed to be more of a religious idea, though it appears that for them this is more of a, uh, you know, a tactical issue in terms of their differences. One is that the Islamic State believes when it liberates territory that then you are under the sovereign control of the Islamic State, and therefore everybody within it needs to pledge bayat to the Caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Um, and therefore everybody needs to sort of follow the rules of the game. Whereas Jabhat al-Nusra believes, as well as al-Qaeda, that um, you know, uh, they need to socialize and normalize the population first before they can really start hitting people with the more um, you know, narrow interpretations of Sharia. So then over time, then uh, it'll become normal within the population. And as a result, you can turn the screws and it's not as big of a deal because most people are like, yeah, this is how it should be. This is how we should live because most people in the population understand that by then. And then this is, uh, I, would, I would argue that this is another element too, is that there's sort of an elite versus masses difference between who are joining or who are supporting these two groups. Um, and I think this sort of in some ways goes back to the, what I mentioned when I first began about the differences between bin Laden and Zarqawi in terms of the DNA of who these individuals are, how they're trying to set up their organizations. Um, and, and in many ways, I do think that, um, you know, as everybody's, you know, been fascinated by all these individuals on social media, these fanboys or, 
you know, online grassroots activists, however you want to describe them, that there have been a, you know, a plethora of them online, but at the end of the day, they're just spouting rhetoric and platitudes of the group. Um, they're not necessarily strategizing as others have mentioned already so far, whereas those within Al-Qaeda and their different branches, I think, are more rigorous thinkers in many ways. Um, so, I don't, it's, this is really difficult to show up because it's a really small uh, thing, but essentially there's been, a comp because of this competition, there have been some fractures and some different changes in loyalties, um, but this is obviously a lot going on here, but there's a lot going on here. But uh, good, good thing I have this slide. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, what have we seen so far? Um, in terms of the Islamic State, we have seen small splinter groups within AQIM, AQ, AQ Khurasan, or Al Qaeda Central, Abu Sayyaf group, and Jama Ansarut Tawhid Indonesian group. Um, that they've been a, some. There have been some breakaway factions, but the thing to remember is that these aren't like the vast majority of these organizations. It's maybe five to fifteen people, at least based off of what we can tell from the open source. Of course, it could be different. Um, and that we shouldn't necessarily overstate these pledges of allegiance to the Islamic State. Um, the question is, is whether these splinter groups can get enough support and build up and then potentially push back against the official branches of Al-Qaeda, but at this time I don't necessarily see it. Um, and then of course you sort of have the more activist ulama or sheikhs like Anjim Shadori and Abdullah Faisal. Whereas for Al-Qaeda, all of their branches have fallen in line. They have not really you know, change step. Um, they've all continued to re-pledge their bayah to Ayman al-Zawahri over the last couple of months, and you've had all of the key jihadi sheikhs not necessarily overtly saying that they're for al-Qaeda, um, but they're definitely against ISIS, um, just because they don't necessarily have membership in the groups like Maktisi and Abu Qatada. And then there's an interesting case of the Caucasus Emirate, which is you know, not been a branch, it's obviously been within the milieu, but they've overtly supported um, the case of Jabhat al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. And then there's a number of groups in play that have been trying to play both sides or get benefits from both sides in terms of potential resources and training. And we've seen that with the groups in North Africa, with Ansar al-Shariya Tunisia, Ansar al-Shariya Libya. Um, and there's been some talk, uh, you know, in the Egyptian and even Israeli media recently that Ansar Beit al-Maktis is just like, foregone conclusion pro-ISIS, but I would argue that it's a little more complicated than that and that they actually still have a lot of communication with groups like AQAP um, and that they're playing both sides as well. And then there's, you know, the recent split within the TTP with Jamaat al-Ahrar, um, which has been interesting because they've had both pro-Al-Qaeda and some pro-ISIS commentary more recently. Um, so, um, as people have noted thus far, um, you know, there is still a lot going on here. This isn't a foregone conclusion that the Islamic State is necessarily going to win this war. I personally think that right now, in the current state of play, that the Islamic State definitely has an advantage due to its media operations as well as the fact that the media itself, the Western media, is really pumping them up in some ways. Um, but because of you know, the potential failures that they could gain on the battlefield now, as well as just the over-the-top nature of how they govern, even though they have been providing social services and governance in a way that they weren't last decade, that it could harm them um, in, in the near to medium term future. I don't necessarily see them being completely destroyed. Um, I just don't think that's going to happen just because there will likely be destabilization in the region no matter what. But I do think that the territory will likely uh, retract a little bit. And as David noted, um, that will obviously hurt them. Um, you know, the biggest question, though, for me is, is what will the Al-Qaeda groups, affiliates, branches do now? Um, can they conduct an attack on the West? Because that will certainly regain them some level of legitimacy. Can Al-Qaeda Central do that again? Can AQAP do that with our third or fourth technology underwear bombs? Um, so time will tell. I don't have any predictions, to be honest with you, because this is complicated. But this is sort of what we're seeing right now. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron, uh, for taking us really uh, deep down uh, the jihadi movement. Uh, this has really been an outstanding uh, 
uh, set of uh, lectures. Uh, I suggest that we take a, a five-minute break, uh, maybe 10 minutes, uh, and reconvene at 10.50, uh, and then we'll have a, uh, a discussion. Uh, so please join us back in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so we're resuming. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of observations, and then we're going to open it up to, to questions, and Asaf is going to ask a question as well. Um, I'm glad that people started injecting some much-needed skepticism into the ISIS issue. Um, uh, I was at a panel in, in Aspen where basically the view was, you know, World War III is coming, um, and I think ISIS has uh, already passed its uh, peak and uh, the, the beheading of Jim Foley will be the moment that historians will say was the beginning of the end for this group. And I think it gets to a larger question about all these groups, which is they face a, a central paradox, which is what they really want to do is they want to control territory and they want to rule like the Taliban. And as soon as they do that, it's the beginning of the end. And we saw that in Anbar province in 2006. We saw that uh, in Mali. Uh, in 2012 and the early 2013. We saw that in southern Yemen with AQAP. We've seen that with Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Because what happens is when you come into an area, it doesn't really matter which area in the Muslim world, and you start banning smoking and music and dancing, uh, and you behave like the Taliban, uh, the people that you've taken over are, are going to do one of two things. They're going to either sort of acquiesce because they, they can't do anything else, um, uh, or they will try and, and, and rise up against you, as we saw in Ambar, uh, which then, of course, AQI uh, was, was basically destroyed by the U.S. Army and, and the Awakening. Um, or they're going to also, you know, as we saw in Mali, they're going to just wait around till they're liberated. Uh, they were not strong enough to rise up against the AQIM. But, you know, when, a, when the French Army is greeted as an army of liberation in a part of the world that was until very recently part of the French Army, a French empire, you get a real sense of how much this group was hated. So I think ISIS is a movie that we've seen before, that they're making exactly the same mistakes they've made before. Um, you know, as Alexander said, uh, you know, I mean, there, are, there are alternatives, realities that we could perhaps sketch out. And I think ISIS could survive if it does two things simultaneously. If you behave like Stalin all the time, you stay in power. You know, total repression uh, does work. It, uh, so if they continue total repression, and the other thing is if they actually deliver services, which I think you know would be a sort of first for these groups, and I think in Raqqa, you know, the electricity is on. So if you combine total repression and deliver services, uh, perhaps you know they could survive. I, I'm quite skeptical, uh, but um, it, it does seem to me that, uh, that that's an unlikely future, but it is a possible future. So that was my sort of main uh, observation here that. Um, uh, we've seen the movie before. It doesn't usually end very well for these groups. Encoded in that, encoded in the DNA of, the, of these groups, are the seeds of their own destruction because they, they ultimately always want to do the same thing, and very few people want want that in their lives. Can just, um, just follow up with a few uh, uh, also uh, remarks and uh, maybe a question also to, that I would like to raise to the uh, panelists. Uh, when we look at the global jihad movement, I think that. Uh, uh, it's a movement that is beset by, by a number of problems, and uh, uh, in the book that I referred to before, uh, Brian Fishman and I refer to the problems that the global jihad movement faces. Uh, we, we group them into kind of two types. One where, uh, one of them uh, is the, the exogenous problems, and this is really kind of the Western uh, counterterrorism uh, efforts, you know, the drone strikes uh, and so forth. But then, but then there's also a set of endogenous problems the global jihad movement uh, faces, and, and, and these were mentioned by, by Peter now, their tendency to uh, uh, to alienate uh, right the populations uh, they can't help themselves right they have to they have to go and, and expand their territory um, now given given the tendency for uh, for the global jihad movement to to inflict wounds upon itself how much additional help does the global, do do these global jihadi actors need from the U S how much does the U S actually have to get involved militarily 
or should we just uh, let you know the uh, these groups, and certainly ISIS uh, among the being uh, among the most barbaric of these uh, groups? How much should we just let them go and just do what they do best, which is to destroy themselves? And or how much should we actually help them by um, by engaging in, uh, in, in in military attacks? And if so, how should they be uh, conceived? So I would I would ask this question to the uh, uh, panelists. Sounds like it. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough question. Okay. Try one more. Cool. All right. Done? Good. Okay. So it's a tough question. I think we should be involved. Um, and there's, there's a few reasons I think we should be involved. One is I wouldn't be surprised, like I wouldn't be shocked if ISIS killed a million people. Um, the death toll is so enormous that I think we can actually save lives, uh, and as we did with the Yazidis, that's a good thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, as I mentioned before, I think that there's a strategic disadvantage uh, to having ISIS be such a powerful force, uh, which is... Um, Hide it. Whoa, okay. <laughs> now it's on. Um, which is that Al-Qaeda is rebranding um, it, as a more moderate face of jihadism. Um, and if ISIS continues as a powerful force, that risks them carrying out a terrorist attack. Uh, a major terrorist attack, if they can control that much territory. Right now, I think, um, you know, that their external operations capabilities are, are very low. Um, over time, if they continue to maintain this much territory, they can keep it. And that could create uh, a problem for, uh, with, with respect to kind of a race to carry out attacks in the West. My view, um, and uh, I know this is in contrast to some opinions that have been expressed, but my view is that right now, Al-Qaeda is not going to strike at the US. Um, and the, the reason why is the US is fighting ISIS. They're gonna let that happen. Um, they, you know, if, if, if they were to strike the US right now, that would cause the US to focus back in on them, which isn't in their interest. Whereas uh, if they let the US and ISIS fight it out, that gives them the ability to undertake their rebrand, let the US bust ISIS up, because I think from Al Qaeda's perspective, once the legitimacy of the claim to the caliphate is gone, then the raison debt is gone, and then Al Qaeda can come back in and sweep in and take the parts of the ISIS movement that wouldn't destroy its brand. I think that, that at some point in the next um, several months, uh, I think that they'll make clear that there are still Al Qaeda loyalists in Iraq in order to try to revive their Iraq network explicitly. Um, I believe that they're already there, but I think that at some point, kind of like with the Indian subcontinent, there'll be an announcement. Um, so uh, we should be involved. I mean, all, all, what all of that says is we should be involved. I think there are strategic reasons to do so, but I think we also have to be aware of um, what the consequence will be of involvement and the ways that our adversaries will try to play uh, in this involvement, particularly ways that AQ wants to benefit from us being there. I, I'm not going to... Uh, uh, I mean, I don't speak on behalf of the United Nations. I'm certainly not going to suggest what the Americans should do. Uh, but, but, but I, I mean, I would say this. I mean, I think, I think, you know, it is clear with all the Al Qaeda affiliates that actually you need a full range of actions to counter them. But you know, you can't rely on one technique or element alone. So I think that that's certainly been a message. I think for for, for all these groups. Um, uh, and on our side, I, mean, we, my, I can't say very much, partly because um, we, we were tasked by a Security Council resolution 2170 last month uh, to report to the Security Council on what, what should be done by early November. So my team are actually leading a kind of an effort to try and make recommendations to the Security Council on this. So I'd, I, I would hold, hold fort until, until that's done. microphones are terrorizing us. Um, I, I would take David's point that non-involvement would require sitting by while the level of destruction that these groups would, would inflict um, would happen. I think there is there are parallels in that. For example, the GIA um, is, is who immediately comes to mind when you think about ISIS. Mm -hmm. And the level of Yes, ultimately self-destructive behavior, but the number, the sheer death toll and the, the terror that they wreaked on the Algerian populace in the interim 
um, is a pretty heavy price to pay. Um, I, I, uh, I was not among the people, and I know there are some of you who got up and listened to the President's speech last night. I slept through the whole night for the first time since I arrived, and I consider that a victory. Um, but I would say that in terms of looking at Al-Qaeda in um, South Asia, Al-Qaeda core, that the disruptive effect of targeting individual leaders and, and the, the requirement that that puts upon the group in order to, to focus on their personal security to fill vacuums, to reestablish lines of communication is a very effective disruptive technique. It's not a solution, it does not, it's not going to destroy the organization, but it does at least keep the group off balance. And thus far, ISIS has not had to deal with that to the same degree. So those kinds of efforts um, could be pretty productive in keeping the group, at a minimum, keeping the group concerned about its personal security, concerned about its organizational security, um, which will, will consume some of the energies that it would otherwise put towards terrorizing the populace. Uh, just briefly to note, not necessarily related to uh, what's going on in Syria or Iraq related to ISIS, but generally I think that we also need to be more aware sort of of what the consequences are of things that we do. I do think that one of the reasons why the Islamic State has been able to be so successful in some ways is as a result of the drone campaign inside of Pakistan because it's killed a lot of key ideological figures that have had importance um, within the broader movement. I'm not saying we shouldn't drone people because I think we still should, but I think we need to understand that there will be um, consequences as re uh, related to that no matter what we do and that's something I think that we usually don't think about. Um, so just of note what potentially could come based off of what we are starting to do now in Iraq, not do in Syria, maybe do in Syria, um, and what that could potentially lead to, so. Excellent. I would, like, I would now like to open uh, uh, the Q&A session to the uh, audience, and we have certainly a lot of knowledgeable uh, people here among the uh, audience. So, um, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Please identify yourself also. Good morning, my name is Sonia Siegmund from the United Nations Truth Supervision Organization with a regional mandate and including uh, Could you please just speak a close in, the in uh, Syria. So yeah. my question concerns Syria in particular. Uh, I have asked this question yesterday already at a panel and I didn't get any answer, so I hope this panel gives some uh, yeah, food for thought um, uh, for me. Um, uh, my question is, I mean, IS, uh, Al Qaeda, Jabhat al Nusra, etc., is shaping the uh, Syrian conflict. Uh, and especially now, IS might influence uh, the posture of all the groups, the parties involved in the Syrian conflict. We have several initiatives uh, that um, deal with several aspects of the Syrian conflict. We have, um, of course, the uh, Special Envoy for Syria trying to find a basis on which uh, the solution of the Syrian conflict can be found. And we have international efforts to count radical groups in Syria and in Iraq. Now, my question is, to which extent or where, in which areas should both initiatives uh, and efforts overlap and maybe be well coordinated? Um, and I just the comment, I was very glad to hear that uh, uh, we shouldn't forget Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, especially in the Middle East. I, I, I totally agree to that. Thank you very much. Look, my view uh, is that the Syrian conflict is devastating from a humanitarian perspective and from a perspective of militancy. Um, you know, I think back to Afghanistan 1979, uh, before the Afghan-Soviet war, and it was, uh, you know, a prosperous, forward-leaning country that has been at war ever since, um, and it's been completely destroyed as a nation state, like, completely destroyed. You've had several generations now in Afghanistan who've known nothing but war. And if, if the current intelligence estimates are right, um, it'll be another decade or more before the Syrian civil war is over, which means you'll have a decade, uh, you'll have a generation of children that has known war their entire life, 
um, jihadist groups are already benefiting, but if the longer this goes on, the more foreign fighters you'll get from the West, from the region, and elsewhere. I think that, the, to me, uh, the cost of insisting that Assad has to go is too high. That is my view. Many of my colleagues disagree with me. Um, but uh, w what I believe should happen, uh, and you know, there are, are obviously questions of implementation, uh, but I think that, that there should be a move to try to give uh, rebel groups that we consider to be um, acceptable, uh, more moderate rebel groups, a zone of autonomy. Uh, there'd be another zone that, uh, that Assad would control, and ultimately you'd end up squeezing out uh, the um, you know, Nusra's and uh, ISIS's. Now, the one problem with this, uh, the, the distasteful aspect of it, is that it uh, ends up with Assad still maintaining some power within the country. Uh, less power than you'd have, given that you're, uh, it, you're creating an autonomous zone, uh, but he still has some power after having inflicted massive atrocities upon his population. Uh, to me, though, even though that is distasteful, it's better than 10 years of war, which I, th I think is the worst of all possible outcomes. I think I'm going to make a counterpoint to that. <laughs> uh, not necessarily related to how to deal with the jihadis, but the argument related to the Assad regime. I think we have to remember that in the current environment now, that there has been a huge rise in sectarianism in the region. And one of the reasons that has given oxygen to the jihadists in the Syrian conflict, and even in Iraq now related to the Shia-led government, is this sectarian angle. And that one of the reasons why so many people have gone to Syria, and why so many people have left the more moderate groups for Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS is because of the Assad regime and the fact that he's been slaughtering all these Sunni individuals. And if we as the West or the United States, from my perspective, back Assad, then that's just going to feed into these narratives that nobody cares about the Sunni Muslims who have already been slaughtered the last three years. Um, I don't have an easy solution. I mean, the situation is really messed up um, uh, because it's got, gotten down this road. But um, I think that there needs to be more of a Sunni Arab solution related to it where we need to bring in the states of the region and not necessarily Assad to help out. But that's my humble opinion. At the risk of falling into one of the latter categories that Alex uh, outlined, the of being informed and informed with an opinion. Um, I will go ahead and venture anyway that one of the mistakes that ISIS has made, which Al-Qaeda made as well, is defining its enemies so broadly that it actually encourages counter coalitions. And when you look at kind of the map of ISIS's enemies, there are some potential for strange bedfellows in, in a global coalition against the organization. Um, I would tend to fall on, on Aaron's side here that Assad is not an ideal member of that coalition for a variety of reasons, um, but there are a number of other groups that have traditionally been reticent to work together, um, governments that had been reticent to work together that could actually cooperate in an effort against ISIS. Um, so that would be one, one thing that I would read. Just a, as a quick matter of clarification, I don't think that the U.S. or any Western countries should side with Assad. Uh, what I'm talking about is simply how to resolve the Syrian conflict, where I think that you have to have talks that involve Assad. In terms of going after ISIS, just to be absolutely clear, I think it would be a terrible idea to have Assad as a coalition partner, given what he's done. Okay. We had a question. Yes, sorry, in the back. Uh, I'm Jack Long from India. I'm doing my PhD at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, it's actually an observation, uh, then more of a question. It's, uh, I think the basic point, I mean, like the most important point, one of the most important points that Dr. Tricia and uh, Dr. Evans has missed out while talking about South Asia is Indian Mujahideen, probably. Uh, they are the go-to organization for the organizations, like the Islamic organizations, maybe the Al-Qaeda, even the uh, Pakistani-sponsored organization like the uh, Laskari Taiba, you know, they are the ones who recruit for them. They are the ones who uh, fund them. I mean, they are the ones who carry out the operation mostly in, in the Indian subcontinent. So considering the fact that uh, the present government in India, the Hindu nationalist government, 
So there is a fear, uh, considering the fact that there is discourse on communal politics versus the liberal politics. So there is a, there is a fear, uh, fear that uh, there will be more uh, a radicalization of Indian Muslims, whereby uh, they would join the uh, radicalized, I mean, like the global jihadist groups, be it the ISIS, be it the LET or Huji or the other uh, Islamic groups in South Asia. So uh, the the fear at the moment is. Uh, since uh, the Pakistan considers these organizations as a strategic, uh, as a, a strategic asset for them, uh, and then the infiltration being carried out, uh, like since the government came into being, so is, uh, there is a fear of uh, uh, war between India and Pakistan not long uh, from now, if, if the infiltration continues, and uh, uh, the radicalization, uh, like uh, further, I mean, like it, it, uh, the Muslims get more radicalized. So, do you see any kind of uh, uh, a warlike situation, considering the factors that I have mentioned. Uh, thank you. That's a great point, and, and I, I should have mentioned the, the election of Modi as a key galvanizing component of uh, um, Al-Qaeda's desire to exploit the situation, because I absolutely agree with you on that, <clears throat> that that creates a, a very ready recruitment platform, not only for Pakistani militants, but for radicalization of, of Indian Muslims as well. Um, in terms of the Indian Mujahideen, I think that it would have to demonstrate a capability to launch larger scale attacks than it has to date in order to um, trigger some kind of conflict between Pakistan and India. Now, if it pairs with Al-Qaeda, if it pairs with lashkar e taiba um, that is a possibility. Um, and I think that there, as I mentioned, I, there is an understandably uh, quick reaction by m most Indian governments to point at Pakistan when there's an attack in India. And, and it could very well be more of this homegrown phenomenon than, than has been admitted. There's also the, the component that Indian counterterrorism efforts against Indian Mujahideen have pushed some of the, the members outside of India into Pakistan and into surrounding areas where they, they do interact with these more transnational militants. So I, do, I don't want to downplay that there is an internal problem in India. Um, I think that Al-Qaeda has not been the primary exploiter of that to date, and that, that's part of what this effort is. It has traditionally been the Pakistani militant groups, but um, Al-Qaeda is sort of throwing its hat in the ring in an effort to do so more effectively, and that is a very worrying uh, trend. And I think that there are a variety of triggers that could happen while the Modi government is in power that would really escalate that, that radicalization cycle. So I completely agree with your concern about that. And all I would, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I think the, um, one of the challenges is, is how do you cover all the different uh, groups that are listed? You know, so I can just uh, share a little anecdote from about a week and a half ago. I gathered uh, our team and we went away for uh, what was going to be half a day to try and discuss every single listed group uh, and some of the unlisted affiliates of Al-Qaeda um, in the, uh, you know, just to be able to have a sort of analytical deep dive. And of course we ran out of time. And in fact we had to do it over three separate sessions. And I think part of that is the dilemma that you do have a range of different uh, affiliates, some of which are more important than others. Um, we, we, we need to, I think, bear in mind, and perhaps you know, tapping back into the theme of this conference, this is a problem that affects many states, and I think one of, and, and, you know, and all citizens potentially, because of kind of globalized travel. And I think one of the um, things we're trying to do is sort of step back. We're 15 years into the United Nations Security Council sanctions regime against Al Qaeda, which was introduced in 1999, before 9/11. Um, but uh, and in response, indeed, to the East Africa attacks in 1998. Um, but I think one of the challenges is, is, is you know, what has changed? Well, one thing that has clearly changed is the, 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 the casualty count from these groups is largely to be found in non, traditionally non-Western states. And it involves uh, uh, activities in a far wider number of states than was the case 15 years ago. Now, I don't want to be the archetypal securocrat uh, and, and sort of say, be, be afraid, be very afraid, P.S., give me more money and staff. Um, but I think we should be conscious of that horizontal expansion as well as kind of a vertical challenge of a, a foreign, foreign terrorist fighter issue. And, and that applies to you know, a range of groups in South Asia as well as a range of groups in, in other parts of the world as well. This is a 
question probably for either Tricia or Alexander, which is following up on the gentleman from India. So what scale of attack in India, traceable to a Pakistani group of some kind, would trigger an Indian response? I mean, if it was a few people being killed, um, they, they probably could overlook it. If it was several dozen, we're in a sort of different space. And what, what would be the Indian response to that kind of attack, where it, did, it, it reached the threshold where uh, they felt they had to retaliate? Uh, he's, he's such a gentleman. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every um, war game or exercise that I participated in that we've looked at this question, um, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, I think that there are a number of factors, um, and it's, it's more than just kind of the scale of attack. Um, I, I've been asked another, many times what will happen if there's another Mumbai. There's not going to be another Mumbai, right? There was a confluence of circumstances that led to a, the attack of that scale and that level of success. Um, but a large-scale attack in India, what would it have to entail? There, there's, I think, several components to it, in that one is the target. Um, the reaction to the you know, attack on the Indian parliament didn't have to have many deaths to have, bring the two countries fairly close to war. So some of it is who the target is. Um, some of it is, is indeed the scale of attacks, although India has demonstrated an ability to absorb casualties that, that the United States certainly does not share. Um, so some of it is, is the scale, some of it is the, the targets, some of it is the domestic politics um, going on in India at the time. Um, and probably some of it is also the ability to persuasively trace the attack back to Pakistan. In terms of uh, the Mumbai attacks, it doesn't get much more persuasive than that. A boat with you know, the, all the things in it, a surviving attacker, um, you know, intercepts of the, the conversations. I mean, talk about smoking guns. I mean, the thing was still firing. Um, and that, in, that India demonstrated a level of resolve there and did not launch a, a military strike speaks to a fairly high threshold for that kind of response. Now, I don't think we should be um, content and assume that there won't be an Indian response um, should there be another large-scale attack. But there has been a fair amount of time that has passed. Um, so I think that there, if one had followed immediately after Mumbai, we would be in a, a different kind of analytic frame than, than we are a number of years later. Um, and I think that one of the lessons that the militants have probably unfortunately learned is that they must cover their tracks better than that. I think if LT did a, its own kind of post-attack exercise and evaluated the failures and successes, the, the, the ability to so clearly pinpoint the organization as the culprit was a huge failure from its perspective. And that future attacks will not be as traceable to the organization, which will create a greater cloud of uncertainty, which has now been exacerbated by Al-Qaeda's statement that it's going to join the foray there. Um, so I, I would not, I don't assert to be a, an expert on, on Indian um, military affairs, but I think that those, the, the domestic response, the domestic politics dynamic of it, where, how the, the government is currently situated, the ability to, to really identify the, the culprit persuasively for the international community and the scale and targets of the attacks will be key variables that we'll have to, to look at. I think Peter asked a very good question, and it's one that should be on our mind. Um, I think the only people who can really answer that question ultimately are going to be Indian officials in the aftermath of such an incident. Uh, but I would note that a range of uh, Indian politicians, including uh, politicians who now play a leading role in the new government, have said that it would be very difficult for India to respond with uh, the same degree of restraint that they uh, uh, exhibited uh, in the aftermath of the Mumbai attack. I just have two very brief points to make on this. One is, one is actually a point again about secrecy. Um, I, I think the operational security of some Al-Qaeda affiliates is stronger than the operational security of others. And I also think there have been lessons learned, not just from you know, perhaps some of the things that have come out in the context of the Mumbai attack, but just, I think, the growing awareness of government capabilities in the last couple of years. And I believe there have been uh, one or two uh, uh, well-known individuals who've contributed to that awareness. Um, uh, but, but I think you know, that, you know, um, Lashkai Taiba, a little bit like uh, some other groups, is a very disciplined organization and it exhibits a, a, a very um, dexterous learning culture in terms of 
learning from error and building capacity. So I think yeah, that's something to, to bear in mind, that we may not have, you know, um, no government may have notice of attacks in future, Wh whereas in the past it may have been possible to have some degree of warning or notice. Uh, and I think that, that is a concern, not just in the context of uh, Lashko Tiber, but also a, a concern in the context of some other groups. And the other thing about Lashko Tiber, of course, it's never pledged buyout or allegiance to Al-Qaeda. And nor has it ever been acknowledged by Al-Qaeda as an affiliate. It is listed in the United, Sa uh, in the United Nations Security Council regime as a, an affiliate of Al-Qaeda. And I think this again points back to, uh, the, it, within this debate about ISIL and Al-Qaeda, you know, we need to think about groups in the context of a movement rather than groups in context of um, uh, expressions of loyalty. Um, so I think that, that remains important. But I think the secrecy point is also something to bear in mind with uh, the, this diaspora of foreign terrorist fighters, uh, both for those who've already returned home and for those who are going to return home or go elsewhere. Um, you know, the risk is that, that these networks can not only kind of provide a framework for potential uh, attack groups, but also kind of uh, for very secure uh, networks within perhaps what is a much more open network. So it's not just the open network of ISIL that we need to think about. It's the, the closed, tightly organized tightly secure networks that might actually support attack planning. If I could just add one more brief point on that. It, I, I, it's worth also pointing out that an outbreak of war or even a military, I don't know what that is, a military escalation of some kind between India and Pakistan, the big winner in that would be Al-Qaeda. Um, because that would involve the Pakistanis moving their forces from the west to the east, and that would free up quite a bit of room in the federally administered tribal areas for, for um, Al-Qaeda. So in a, strategically, it actually makes a ton of sense for Al-Qaeda to try and hit India in a way that it's unclear who did it, so that the Indians will blame the Pakistani government with, with plenty of historical reason to do so, and that thereby open up that space for Al-Qaeda um, on the other side of the border. So that's, that's also, I think, a consideration worth thinking about. Okay, we, uh, <clears throat> we're almost uh, at the end because we have to uh, keep it today to 11.30 based on uh, rescheduling, but we have uh, maybe time for one, one more question, sir. Yes. <clears throat> Please identify yourself. Also. My name is my name is Richard Horowitz. Can any of the panelists discuss whether the implications of anything that's been discussed this morning on Africa? There are implications to this competition on Africa. Um, I think that, that it differs from one place to another. Uh, in general, if you look at groups that have left, Al or, or not groups, but um, you know, factions within uh, Al-Qaeda-aligned groups that have explicitly aligned themselves with ISIS instead of Al-Qaeda, it's been people who for some reason have been unhappy uh, with either the direction of their organization or their place within it. So um, Shabab, uh, it's very clear, is an Al-Qaeda affiliate. Um, when the new leader was announced after Gaddafi's death, uh, they promptly took Bayad again to Al-Qaeda. Shabab as an entity is not going to defect um, into uh, the ISIS column. However, it's a group that's had a great deal of infighting uh, over the course of the past few years. In fact, in late August, shortly before Godani was killed, um, there was a, a high-level uh, member of Shabab including, uh, accusing him of being a Western intelligence agent. You, know, you might have a faction that aligns with ISIS, not because they're more pro-ISIS ideologically, but because they're unhappy with where they are within Shabab. For Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia, um, the way I assess it, and Aaron and I may see this a little bit differently, but I assess the leadership as being pro-Al-Qaeda uh, and firmly in the pro-Al-Qaeda uh, camp, but the foot soldiers being much more in the pro-ISIS camp. Uh, the reason being that overwhelmingly Tunisians who've gone over and fought in Syria have been, have, have fought with ISIS. They had bad experiences with Nusra. As a result, I think what, what we're seeing now is uh, the opening up of a new front within Tunisia uh, with much more cooperation with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. But, and the reason why I think that's happening is to try to swing uh, some of the foot soldiers back into the pro-Al-Qaeda camp by giving them some experience of working with AKIM. 
Um, you know, others I think are much less affected. Uh, I see less evidence of um, either Nigeria and the jihadist movements there being affected much by the competition. Um, but I, I think in both Somalia and Tunisia, those are places where it's acutely felt in some different ways uh, and that the strategy has, has uh, uh, swung quite a bit in Tunisia in particular uh, as a result specifically of that competition. Please. I think that's a, a very good question to ask. I'm just on the grounds that, you know, I think it, it is very easy to end up focused on the uh, area of immediate crisis and of greatest media attention rather than, you know, uh, uh, looking across the, uh, the field. Just picking up on some of the themes that have come out of this session and how they might apply with uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates in Africa. And this comes from, I've traveled extensively both in East Africa and West Africa and in the Maghreb in the last year and a half. Um, but I don't pretend to be an Africa specialist. Um, but, but I think, you know, the first thing is, both with Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, these are quite variegated organizations. You know, in many ways, they are plural groups of people, some of whom have close relationships uh, with AQ affiliates or AQ core, some of whom have much more distant relationships. And we've seen that in terms of the internal debate within Al-Shabaab. Uh, you see that in terms of the networks uh, within Boko Haram as well. Um, I think the second thing is, um, if, we, uh, if we are worried about the way in which uh, actions are used for other purposes, and in particular fundraising purposes, the, the competition for funding and volunteers and branding in the movement, the way in which Al-Shabaab uh, mimicked the Mumbai attack in Westgate, I would argue it was a response to actually a greater weakness of Shabaab inside Somalia. So Shabaab was contained inside Somalia there was a greater need to exhibit, including to donors, that it was still a relevant actor. And Westgate was a, a way to do that and actually, in a sense, send a message to people who might then uh, renew their support. And then uh, foreign terrorist fighters. Let's not forget that foreign terrorist fighters have been in Somalia for years, uh, linked to Shabab. You've had also, you have a, a significant group of foreign terrorist fighters in Libya today as well. So, so while, again, our focus is naturally on, on ISIL and, and ANF, we shouldn't neglect those areas. And the other final thing, just to, to, just to note, is we are looking at some uh, foreign terrorist fighters in, uh, or working with ISIL uh, and ANF who link back to um, parts of Africa that have not seen an Al-Qaeda-related problem before. So, you know, the challenge is not, you know, in, in, a, in states like Algeria or Egypt uh, or Somalia or Nigeria or Kenya, um, there has already been a, an existing counterterrorism problem and state capacity has grown to respond to that. But in a range of other states where even, even it might be sort of a tail of this, you, you're going to be talking about states with very limited capabilities or where the security services are fundamentally structured to deal with different types of threats. So I think you know, the, the need to kind of adjust and engage is going to be there uh, with some of this long tail of foreign terrorist fighters. Okay. Aaron? Um, I, think, I think one of the things to also add to this and note is that um, you know, after 9-11, we had this unprecedented level of unipolarity within the global jihadi movement. Some would argue that now maybe it's more bipolar. Um, but I would actually argue that it's more multipolar and it's more similar to the 1990s. Um, while it's definitely true that groups, um, you know, work with each other, say AST and AQIM, I do think that they have different interests depending on the situation. I think on a regional level, the groups might have similar interests, but on a local level, they have different interests, and you could say that about other groups Libya too, probably, same with Somalia and Nigeria, though I don't know as much about Nigeria. Um, so I think it's a, another aspect to remember related to that, even though we have been discussing a lot about the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda specifically, but there are all these other jihadi actors too that are part of this broader movement or sort of parallel international system of jihadists, I guess you could say potentially, um, and that they have their own aims and interests as well in addition to what Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State are trying to do. Um, and that at some points they might overlap and some points they might differ. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you, I can probably speak uh, for all of us that uh, this was not enough time, and uh, I wish this could uh, go on, but uh, we have to, uh, all good things have to come to an end. And, uh, but uh, please help me thank the uh, it's really outstanding uh, panel um, for their insights. And we will be sure to, uh, <clears throat> to reconvene next year. Uh,